అనంత కోటి వైష్ణవులకి దాని గౌరవ ప్రేమ అయింది ఆల్ గ్లోస్ టు దిమిల్ డివోటీస్ ఆల్ గ్లోస్ టు దిమిల్ డివోటీస్ ఆల్ గ్లోస్ టు దిమిల్ డివోటీస్ ఆల్ గ్లోరీస్ ఆల్ గ్లోస్ ఆల్ గ్లోస్ టు శ్రీ శ్రీ గురంగ గౌరంగ చరిత్ గురు శివ ప్రభుపాదకి So reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 33, Activities of Lord Kapila. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Text 31 Tadvirashit Punyatamam Shetram Trailokya Vishrutam Namna Siddha Padam Yatra Sasam Siddhi Mupeshyusi Tadvirashet Punyatamam Shetram Trailokya Vishrutam Namna Siddha Padam Yatra సాసం సిద్ధిము పేశుషి తద్వీరాశిత్ పుణ్యతమాం క్షేత్రం త్రైలోక్య విశ్రుతం నామ్నా సిద్ధ పదం యాత్ర సాసం సిద్ధిము పేశుషి తద్వీరాశి పుణ్యతమాం క్షేత్రం త్రైలోక్య విశ్రుతం నామ్నా సిద్ధ పదం యాత్ర సాసం సిద్ధి ముపేశ్యుషి తద్వీరాశి పుణ్యతమాం క్షేత్రం త్రైలోక్య విశ్రుతం నామ్నా సిద్ధ పదం యాత్ర సాసం సిద్ధి ముపేశ్యుషి తద్వీరాశి పుణ్యతమాం క్షేత్రం త్రైలోక్య విశ్రుతం నామ్నా సిద్ధ పదం యాత్ర సాసం సిద్ధి ముపేశ్యుషి ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ బేజ్ వెంకటేశ్ ఏసి భక్తి అంత స్వామి శిల ప్రభుపాద్ శిల ప్రభుపాద్ కి ద ప్లేస్ వేర్ దేవూతి అచీవ్ పర్ఫెక్షన్ మై డియర్ విదురా ఇస్ అండర్స్టుడ్ టు బి అ మోస్ట్ సేక్రెడ్ స్పాట్ ఇట్ ఇస్ నోన్ ఆల్ ఓవర్ ద త్రీ వర్ల్డ్స్ యాస్ సిద్ధ పద let's continue reading the other translations text 32 dear vidura the material elements of our body have melted into water and are now a flowing river which is the most sacred of all rivers anyone who bathes in that river also attains perfection and therefore all persons who desire perfection go bathe there text 33 my dear vidura The great sage Kapila, the personality of Godhead, left his father's hermitage with the permission of his mother and went towards northeast. Text 34 While he was passing in the northern direction, all the celestial denizens known as Charanas and Gandharvas, as well as the Munis and Damshils of heavenly planets, prayed and offered him all respects. The ocean offered him oblations and a place of residence. Oh, it is understood that 
Kapila Muni first went towards the Himalayas and traced the course of river Ganges. And he came to the delta of Ganges at the sea now known as the Bay of Bengal. The ocean gave him residence at a place still known as Ganga Sagara, where the river Ganges meets the sea. That place is called Ganga Sagara Tirtha, and even today, people gather there to offer respects to Kapila Deva, the original author of Sankhya system of philosophy. Unfortunately, this Sankhya system has been misrepresented by an imposter who is also named Kapila. But that other system of philosophy does not tally with anything described in the Sankhya of Kapila in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshirun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gradhara Shri Vasadi Gauru Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome to today morning Srimad Bhagavatam class. So in the in the first verse it says the place where Devahuti achieved perfection, my dear Vidra is understood to be a most sacred spot. It is known all over the three world as Siddhapada. So what we can understand from here is the places lived by the saintly people or who have achieved perfection in their bhakti. So all those places are considered to be the sacred spots or places of worship. So anything that is attached to the saintly people, say for example the places where Prabhupada has lived, the places where you know the rooms which Prabhupada has stayed. So all that has been preserved for a particular reason because they are considered to be transcendental. The potency of that saintly people is still there in those particular places. Say for example the Bhajan Kutir what we have in most of the dams. So the places where people lived and the clothes which they wore, the paraphernalia which they wore. Say for example many of the devotees I came across they have some of the remnants of their acharyas or some remnants even of Prabhupada's dhoti. This is considered to be very, very sacred or transcendental. So that is the inference which we need to understand here. And we, it is always a spiritual attachment. It is always necessary for us to have that particular attachment to our Guru so that we can purify ourselves by keeping our minds always engaged in fulfilling the mission of our Guru. And moving forward in the next few verses. So, we have importance of rivers being mentioned. So it's mentioned that her body have entered into water and are now a flowing river which is the most sacred of all rivers. Anyone who bathes in that river also attains perfection. And also in text 44, Prabhupada in the purpose speaks about uh, Ganga Sagara. So I thought I would touch base on this class based on this Theme, which is uh, sacred uh, river Ganges. So, what we can understand from rivers? Rivers are basically gift of nature. So, we all know that human society flourishes by the gift of nature, like rivers, mountains, trees, etc. So, if if you see the most important gifts of nature is the river. So let's see, like in South America, we have one of the biggest river, uh, Amazon. In North America, we have Mississippi. In Africa, we have Nile and Congo. Similarly, we have rivers in most of the countries. And if you see most of the civilizations, they grew up on the banks of a particular river. You can even take example of Indus Valley civilization or Mesopotamia civilization. So the civilization grew up on the banks of river. So Mesopotamia is the modern day Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Turkey. So the civilization was completely relying on the source of river. So Srila Prabhupada says one must not live where there is no temple or where there is there are no friends, friends or associates, if not at least friends, or where there is no river. 
So this is what Prabhupada says. Prabhupada most often quotes this from uh, Chanakya Pandit. So if you see the importance of rivers, rivers are considered to be the backbone of human civilization. They are the biggest source of livelihood. They carry a lot of sediments that are rich in minerals and they provide fertility to the soil which is you know which can then completely use to grow crops and these are one of the primary sources for irrigation for agriculture and they are the largest sources of fresh water for humanity so they go and they merge into the sea and then sun evaporates them into the form of clouds and we again get the purest form of distilled water in the form of rain and which recharges the river. So that is how the ecosystem functions. So the clouds are one of the most massive desalination plant that is provided naturally by Krishna. So rivers play a major part in all of this. So not all the rivers are considered to be sacred. That is something which we, it's a key takeaway. So most of the sacred rivers are present in India. So Krishna is so compassionate that you know, he has given such an environment, such a planet which is very very conducive to cultivate bhakti. So if you see most of the higher planetary systems, they are designed for sense gratification. So cultivation of bhakti is possible but it is not as easy as how it is in this earth planet. So Krishna has given a lot of options for us to practice bhakti, to cultivate that attitude of bhakti, to serve the lotus feet of Krishna. And rivers are one of the most important aspect of what Krishna has provided for us. So that is how uh, we should take this. So the river system, if, if, if you see right, like when you go, most of the, when you go to a river, when you go on the banks of a river, you find that soothing experience when the breeze of the rivers touches you, anybody who is in Shantarasa, they experience some bhakti or some acknowledgement of a higher creator or a higher authority. So anybody who, and especially if they are in front of a sacred river, so it's mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam in most of the places that even the breeze that flow, that comes from a sacred river like Ganges or Yamuna, so it purifies that person. It is an impetus for people to cultivate bhakti or it is an impetus for people to practice bhakti. We can get that devotional attitude just by staying on the banks of a river. So that's what Prabhupada says in most of the purpose in Srimad Bhagavatam. And rivers also have a lot of spiritual significance. Most of the important ceremonies or yakyas that we perform, people pretty much tend to have the water from the holy rivers because it's considered to be really really sacred so we will come really close and see why it is considered to be sacred we'll take example of mother ganga and even before applying tilak what we do is we recite the names of all the rivers and may all these be present in this particular water so that is how we invoke auspiciousness and make that water which we use for applying tilaka to be like really really sacred and most of the sages if you see when they face any sort of difficulties or when they are trying to detach or they, when they are trying to practice bhakti or taking one prastha, they go to banks of river and then start their journey. And also if you see why is that is because the atmosphere is so conducive for cultivating the mode of goodness. So one can practice bhakti being in any mode but being in mode of goodness the atmosphere really, really matters and that is really, really conducive for practicing bhakti. So that is why if you see even in, you know, in olden days and even in modern days, most of the spiritual practitioners go on the banks of rivers. So it's, it's very, very evident and very, very obvious that they get that mental peace or they be very, very a soothing atmosphere, the breeze and everything. It is very, very conducive to practice bhakti. So, and sages also most often build their hermitages as well on the banks of river. Say for example, Kapilate built his hermitage on Ganga Sagra. So we come to see why that name Ganga Sagra has come. So some of the purpose from uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada 
mentions that the water of the Ganges is called Patita Pavani, the deliverer of all sinful living beings. It is a proven fact that a person who regularly bathes in Ganges is purified both externally and internally. Externally, his body becomes immune to all kinds of disease and internally, gradually, he develops a devotional attitude towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Throughout India, many thousands of people live in the banks of Ganges and they are regularly bathing in her waters. They are undoubtedly being purified both spiritually and materially. So, and again, in few other in some uh, one other purport, Prabhupada says, all these rivers are transcendental. Therefore, one can be purified just by remembering them, just by touching them or bathing in them. So, we don't even have to go and live by the branks of rivers. Prabhupada says very clearly that even just by remembering the names of the rivers, even just by desiring to be there, we get purified. So, that is the potency all these sacred rivers carry in this earthly planet. So, in Chaitanya Chaitamrita, one of the purpose, Prabhupada writes, India has many sacred rivers such as Ganges, Yamuna, Narmada, Kaveri and Krishna and simply by bathing in these rivers, people are liberated and they become Krishna conscious. And also, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in his conversation with Sarabhom Bhattacharya that Krishna incarnates in Kali Yuga in two forms, in the form of wood and the form of water. So, in the form of wood, he comes as Jagannath and in the form of water, he comes as Mother Ganga. And Mahaprabhu also says the two reasons why he would prefer to go to Bengal from Puri is one, to visit his mother Sachi and number two is to visit Mother Ganges. So Mahaprabhu performed a lot of pastimes in, across, in, in the shores of Ganga. So he used to play with all his Gopa friends and that is because you know, Yamuna offered a lot of services in Krishna Leela in Vrindavan where Krishna performed his pastimes where Mother Yashoda bathes Krishna and Krishna plays a lot of water sports with his Gopa friends. He performs his Rasa Leela on the banks of Yamuna. He plays his flute, has his lot of intimate pastimes with gopis. So then Ganga seeing that she had a desire to please Krishna and she wanted to serve Krishna in the same way. So in order to fulfill that desire, Krishna came down as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the mood of Radharani and he gave a lot of intimate association to Ganga. At one point in time it is said that Ganga grew so much and Mahaprabhu was on the shore of Ganges and she swelled so much and she came and touched the lotus feet of Mahaprabhu. So these are some of the pastimes which Acharyas explain. And in, in Padma Purana as well there is one pastime which is mentioned. So there was a Brahmana Bandhu. He is born in a Brahmin family but he has not performed any of the sacrifices to cultivate Brahminical qualities. All he has been leading in was a sinful life. So one day he went uh, on the shore of Ganges and apparently due to some reason that he had to uh, leave his body. Then Yamadutas come there. So they try to, uh, you know, take, take the life out of him. And what happens is at the same time, Vishnuduta also comes. So what happens? Why Vishnu Dutta comes is because when that Brahmana's body was lying on the shore of the ocean, another Brahmana came back and he felt pity and he just sprinkled some water from Ganges. So basically even Brahmana was leading a sinful life. He just left his body on that place and another Brahmana passing by just sprinkled some water from Ganges on his body. So when Yamadutas came, as per the schedule to take him, then Vishnu Dudas came and there was an argument there. And in the end what happened is Vishnu Dudas took him back to Godhead. So that is the importance that we are talking about which is mentioned here that even a breeze from the river or even desiring to be on the shore or on the banks of river can 
give you liberation. So these are all exceptional cases which is mentioned in the Puranas for the importance of you no know, understanding the importance of the sacred rivers. So Mahaprabhu visited most of all of the sacred rivers in fact and each of the sacred rivers has some significance. Just knowing the river, knowing that the river is sacred will not give the taste for being in that river. Right? Say for example, you can take Tungabhadra. Tungabhadra is the place where Lord Ram resided for almost four months before he went, before he started his search for Sita. And that is one more, uh, I think it's Prayaswani river in somewhere in Kerala. And that is where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu found Brahma Samhita, the hundred verses recited by Brahma. So every river has some sacred, like some stories behind where all the sages or the divine personalities have performed their pastimes. So it is important for us to understand all this so that we can actually get into that rasa when we go and live by that particular river. And also if you see the whole Krishna consciousness movement was structured in Prayag. That's where all the Goswamis, they completely put down the philosophy and all the books. So it's, it's very, very important for everybody to at least remember these rivers or spend some time on the banks of these rivers. So we can learn that from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who has visited all the rivers and Prabhupada he used to give a lot of lectures during Kumbha Mela in the banks of Ganges. And there is one past time where Prabhupada was staying in Rishikesh with Tamar Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And then he says that he was looking at Ganges and he says that I wish I had a glass of water from this Ganges. Then immediately Tamar Krishna Maharaj, even with all his clothes, he went, ran inside. He took some water and gave it to Prabhupada. So, that's the rasa we need to carry just by looking at Ganges or just even by thinking of Ganges. So, why Ganges is so, so important? So, it is really, so there are two stories, right, for the descent of Ganges. So, if you see the Ganges, there is, so the places where two or more rivers join, it's called as a confluence. Okay, so Ganges has the official name after the confluence at Devaprayag. So in Devaprayag, river Bhagirathi and river Alaknanda, they both join and Ganges gets officially her name after that particular con confluence. So there are two stories. So let me try to put this in as much of cohesive way as possible. So, the descent of Ganga happens in two places in Srimad Bhagavatam. One, when Lord Vamnadev takes the third step on the head of the universe, he pierces the universe, right? And the water from the causal ocean passes through his feet to the universe. And that is one story of the descent of uh, Ganga. So what happens, the water cleans the feet of Vishnu and it's called as Charanamrit. So Shiva held this water in his head for 1000 millennium years. And after that, Shiva released this water into this earth planet. So first the water comes to Dhruvaloka. So this is all that in Canto 8 of Srimad Bhagavatam. So first the water comes to Dhruvaloka, Dhruvamara accepts this as Charanamrit. And then it comes to Saptarishi Loka and they retain it for some time and they consider that this is to be the topmost perfection of Bhakti and then it is carried by billions of celestial airplanes and comes down to Chandra Loka, Brahma Loka and comes down to Mount Meru and from Mount Meru there are four branches called Sita, Alaknanda, Chakshu and Bhadra so this branch from all the other three branches they go to different oceans, the salt water oceans around the covering of the earth planet, earth planet the Bhumandala. So, this Alakananda stream comes down and it hits earth. So, where does this Alakananda originate from in this first story? So, we saw the confluence at Devaprayag, 
is Alaknanda and Bhagirathi. So now this is, we are talking about Alaknanda. So after entering the earth planet, Alaknanda flows, it starts from Badrinath. There is a glacier called as Satopan Glacier. So the source of rivers are mostly glaciers and Alaknanda and Bhagirathi are headwaters. So the original source of Alaknanda is from Badrinath Satopan Glacier and from there it flows to a place called Joshima. So every every place has a significance. So there is a temple of Narsingha Dev in Joshimath. So there is a deity of Narsingha Dev sitting made of stone and his arms naturally becomes thinner and thinner. So in Puranas it is mentioned that the day we are not able to see his arms, we won't be able to access the Satopan glacier because humanity has fallen down so so much and they become so so impure and this glacier will not be accessible at all and right now from Badrinath it's a one of the most difficult treks around one day two day trek to go to Satopan glacier so still a lot of people a lot of devotees go there and a lot of people they do the Char Dham Yatra Gangotri, Yamanotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath because all of these are considered to be like really really sacred so after Joshimath, it the first confluence. Okay, even before coming to Deva Priya, there is a first confluence where Alaknanda merges with Dauli Ganga. So that's the first confluence. And then Alaknanda, after that, the second confluence is called as this first confluence is called as Vishnu Prayag, and the second confluence is called as Nanda Prayag, where Alaknanda merges with River Nandakini. And then the third confluence is called as Karna Prayag where she merges with Pindar Ganga and the fourth confluence is important because it starts from Kedarnath and the fourth confluence Alaknanda merges with Mandakini and then in the fifth confluence from where it is officially called as Ganges Alaknanda merges with Bhagirathi so now where does Bhagirathi originate from so we all know that story right so the original source of Bhagirathi river is from Gangotri glacier and even from Gangotri glacier the actual source is in a place called as Gomuk. Gomuk is the mouth of cow or the mouth of earth and that's another difficult trek from Gangotri. So from Puranas what we can understand is that you know Kapila Dev curses King, uh, so what happened? Kapiladev curses King Sakara for some offenses, right? And then before he could purify all those offenses, he leaves his body. And then his son Anshuman meets Lord Kapiladev and he says that the only way to purify the sin is to bring down the water from the holy Ganges. So he performs lots of austerities and he couldn't. To, he couldn't achieve that in his lifetime and then his son Dilip came, he couldn't achieve that and then King Bhagirath came and he was performing so much of tapasya that Ganges descended down and she said that I can't come down to earth for two reasons she gave two reasons that the force of my water is really really strong and earth will not be able to withstand it and the second reason was there are a lot of sinful people in earth, planet, and I will become impure because of them. So now let's go for the first reason. So when Lord Shiva, the water entered the universe, when Vishnu placed his foot on the universe and he pierced the universe, and Lord Shiva held it in his hair for almost thousand millennia, right? So this is the way which in which I understand or I was able to reconcile this is when Bhagirath performed the penances and then Mother Ganga appeared and said that the force of the water will be too strong then Bhagirath performed austerities so and then he pleased Lord Shiva who is Ashutos who get pleased very very easily and then Shiva agreed to hold Ganges 
and then channelize it completely. So what happens is the first problem is solved. And then the second problem, there are a lot many sinful people. So Bhagirath mentioned Ganges that there are a lot of pure devotees as well. When pure devotees take bath in Ganges, she gets purified automatically. And after all of that, Ganges decided, okay, fine, I will descend down to earth. So it was King Bhagirath's effort as one of the effort as well, how Mother Ganga descended to this earth planet. So he was driving his chariot very fast and then he came across, you know, there's a rishi called as Janu Rishi. So the force of the water was so strong that it it penetrated the Rishi's ashram, the Rishi using his mystical powers, he swallowed the entire Ganges. And then <coughs> Bhagirath was looking back from his chariot, that is the water, that is Ganges, is not there. Then he went and begged Janu Rishi to, you know, release Ganges and he, he releases through his ears. And that's why she is also called as Janavi. So, and after all this, when Ganges hits earth, the altitude of earth was so, so high and then immediately she was frozen. And that is this Gangotri glacier we are talking about. So the source is still few kilometers from Gangotri glacier, which is called as Gomuk, which is called as the mouth of earth or the mouth of cow. So this, this is how, and then from there it flows for close to 195 kilometers and the confluence at Deva Prayag happens with Aratmanda. So this is how we can reconcile both of the stories and understand how Ganges descended to earth. So, and after that, she flows through Rishikesh, Haridwar, Varanasi, that's where Ganges hit the plains, and then Kashi, Allahabad. Allahabad is the place which is called as Triveni Sangam, where Ganga, Yamuna, and Saraswati, there's a confluence, the merging of all three rivers. And then, the time after she is officially called as a Ganges, she flows for 2500 kilometers, and then finally, she merges with Bay of Bengal in Calcutta, in Mayapur. And that is place is called as Ganga Sagara, and that is what Kapilamuni is that that is the place where Kapilamuni built his hermitage. So even now in Jan and December, December time, Jan time during the Makar Sankranti time, we have people visiting this particular place and worshipping Lord Kapilate. So why this is considered to be like really, really sacred? And you know, what is the significance of uh, Kumbh Mela? Because every time during Kumbh Mela, like people come with a lot of faith and it's, it's a place of, Ganges is just even place of faith for almost 20 billion people. It's, it's also a place of pilgrimage. People come with different faith, especially during Kumbh Mela. So what, what happens, the story behind this uh, Kumbh Mela, right? So we all know that the churning of milk ocean, right? So Durvasamuni curses Indra. Because Indra did not pay respects when Durvasamuni gave him some garland. So most often here we get a lot of garlands and we understand the importance, right? So Indra, he does not understand the importance of the Mahaprasad, the garland received as uh, Mahaprasad. So he just takes that garland and puts on the tusk of his elephant. And the elephant doesn't, you know, places it on the floor. And then what happens, like, you know, we, when we say elephant, we can remember one more story, right? Like, again, that's the mercy of the Lord. So, story of uh, Gajendra. So, we need to understand that Maya, whether you are a human being or you're in a human body or in an animal body, Maya will give you a situation wherein you will have no way out. So, elephant is supposed to be one of the strongest of animals, right? But still, and crocodile is like nothing in front of an elephant compared. But still, Gajendra was put in a position where he could actually do nothing. He could absolutely do nothing. So, that is Maya's duty. But all what he did was, okay, I am not an elephant. 
with all my powers is completely useless so the train of thoughts even at that point in time it it was away from the bodily conception so the key takeaway for us from the story is like the moment you leave that bodily conception you realize that basically you are not in control things are absolutely not in your control right the moment you realize that understanding that as a knowledge is different but when you actually realize that based on your experiences that's when mercy of the law flows so when gajendra realized that this body is useless he could do nothing so he got all his memories he regained all his memories from his previous birth and he didn't ask krishna to save him actually he didn't ask krishna to save him instead with his trunk he just plucked a lotus and offered to krishna and said that this is your body do whatever you want it so this is exactly how we fall back when we are in trouble so it's it's basically we need to understand from shrimad bhagavatam what happens when different personalities have followed the philosophy what happened when different personalities did not follow the philosophy so all these examples when you analyze very closely as in when you grow in different stages of devotion you will get different realizations so it's very very important that you know when we say we see krishna through your ears you take your ears cut this ear out cut this ear out and join both of them it will form the shape of the heart so that is what you know people mean by you know you see krishna through your ears when you keep listening to shrimad bhagavatam it purifies you and krishna enters your heart so it's it's very very important so different people they have different realizations so coming back to you know the story of indra so just because of elephant i just touched a bit there so what happened is like you know there was some many curses and then they start losing to demons at that point in time the devtas still they went and took shelter of their acharyas so again in this place what we can understand is during difficult circumstances we always take say for example it's, it's impossible for us to understand the will of the lord we are not that pure like pralad maharaj or dhruva maharaj so most often people ask questions what do i do if i don't understand the will of the lord i am not able to interpret krishna do we really think we can interpret krishna that's not at all possible so many acharyas give many answers so what i found as the best explanation for this is you no know, taking from here and there so basically if if you're not if you're stuck in a position in life where you're not able to understand the will of krishna what am i going to do in life so basically at that point in time whatever services comes in your way just continue doing that that's the best thing which you can do which will be conducive for your spiritual life whether you are a brahmachari or a krista doesn't matter have the association whatever service comes in your way just do it and you will get the clarity if you have a guru then reach out to your guru and be part of your guru's mission or whatever is your guru's desire this is the best possible thing which we can do and ultimately it all boils down whatever we do ultimately everything every single thing boils down to the quality of your chanting how attentive are you when you chant so that this is the you know, how much ever we eat how much ever we we get confused whether it's a brahmachari or whether it's a krista we go back and we ask this question you know i'm i'm having this trouble in life and i need that trouble in life you know but it will be very hard for guru to say this the conclusion of all the scriptures is to chant properly recite the holy names properly so what devatas did here coming back to the story they took shelter of brahma so every time when they have a problem they always go to brahma this is not the first time and then brahma prays to lord vishnu and then he comes up with a solution so it's it's very very evident right like when people say that you know i don't need a living guru why do i need a living guru and they reject the guru parampara and all this nonsense for so many reasons chaitanya mahaprabhu accepted a guru krishna accepted a living guru we have so many examples of all of this so where is the problem where are you not able to reconcile it's it's basically inside your head there is absolutely no problem because it is already reconciled and you are just not able to accept it you are not able to you know 
be that much humble so only when you be that humble to know the peace in each other only that is the only time when you will be able to your body will be receptive of mercy so humility gratitude all that is very very important for your body to be receptive of that mercy which is flowing through vaishnavas or krishna so these qualities must be cultivated and how do we cultivate all these qualities just by listening to all the stories from shrimad bhagavatam and following the personalities who have followed the philosophy properly so coming back again so they churn the milk ocean and there a lot of things happening which are not going much detail into that story and then but krishna tells one thing if the first poison comes out and shiva drinks the poison and when brahma go and speaks to vishnu vishnu says one thing keep churning whatever disturbances come or whatever bad thing happens in between do not give up so we can apply this even in our bhakti like you know we keep squeezing in our heart krishna will squeeze your heart to the maximum he wants 100% not 99.9% krishna wants your heart 100% so whatever disturbances come don't lose faith so they kept doing then jewels came lakshmi came and finally dhanvantri comes with a golden pot so if you see in this particular story for a good cause devatas and demons they unite together so that is how to get the nectar so that is how devotees unite together to get the nectar of devotion so once dhanvantri comes with that pot immediately the demons take it then again devatas didn't lose faith so they were okay fine they still had faith and then vishnu comes in the form of mohini murti and the pot comes back and the demons realize that uh, oh yeah we have been cheated finally because they didn't take shelter of their guru or krishna so the war starts so what happens the story says that indra's son jayanta so during the war happened for 12 years and during that 12 years uh, this was uh, the nectar was hidden four places and in all those four places is where kumbh mela happens once in 12 years it is believed that the nectar emanates there in ganges once in 12 years so that is why this is considered to be very very sacred so every river is considered to be like really really sacred and people who comes with material benefits with faith during that time and when they take bath in ganges yeah their desires are fulfilled and people who like businessmen politicians brahmacharis they come there desiring for love of god it and grihastas or people who wants to get married they come there asking for a good wife and grihastas who are married they will come and pray for their wife to be good so anything can any wishes you desire and you take bath during that period in kumbh mela you will be purified there is no way and this is the benefit of you know that's why ganges is considered to be like most most sacred and during prior during this particular time i think in 1976 or 77 prabhupad even though his health was not very conducive for traveling he went down to the kumbh mela and he was you know setting an example for the others he was going there and he was giving lectures he was performing a lot of devotional services and a lot of devotees even followed him and our acharyas do this to just set an example for us it is not that we are always living in a tham and everything but at the same time prabhupada also says depending on time place and circumstance all the benefits you know that we get by the radhanath swami says this in one of the lectures he goes through but in all the benefits that we get by bathing 100 times in ganges the same benefits is obtained just by reciting the holy name shuddha naam so can we recite shuddha naam is the question we recite at nama prada stage or nama bhasha stage so what do we need to do to get most of us recite at the nama bhasha stage so what do we need to do to get from nama bhasha stage to shuddha naam stage chant one 
pure, hundred percent pure name. It's only through the mercy of Vaishnavas or the mercy of dhams, holy places. That is how we go beg for that love of God, like to purify our heart. So this is the most important, uh, you know, takeaway. So from that time, Ganges descends or hits Haridwar. She travels for almost 2,500 kilometers, and then the delta is called as Ganga Sagra. That's where Kapil Muni goes. So we saw the, you know, the structure of, you know, from Deva Prayag and that's the confluence from where officially she's called as Ganges where Bhagirathi and Alaknanda meets. So we saw the importance of rivers, we saw the descent of Ganges and from Deva Prayag we have two, that confluence area, have two headwater sources. One is Alaknanda which comes from Badrinath, the Satopan glacier and we saw from where all it flows and what are the five confluences even before coming to Deva Prayag and then that is one side and that comes from Mount Meru, the source Alaknanda. And then we saw the story of King Bhagirath, how it flows from Gangotri. And so now let's let's understand, you know, like Ganges as a river, she is not impersonal. Like when you say government, right? It's 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 a very impersonal terminology. Under government there are ministries and there are departments. And then finally, it all boils down to one person sitting in a particular position, right? So it's it's personal. There is a presiding deity. So it's it's non it's non different, right? Like the Charanamrit which we have every morning, it is non different from Mother Ganges. So who is actually this Ganges, the personality in the spiritual world, right? It, it is mentioned that Ganges, the carrier of Ganges, is called Makara, which is a white crocodile. And goddess Ganges, Ganga Devi, she has like four arms, two upper arms and two lower arms. So the two upper arms, one faces up and one faces down. The arm which faces up, it's in Abhaya Mudra, she grants fearlessness. And the arm which is facing down, it's Varada Mudra, she grants benedictions. And on the two lower hands, she holds one lotus and one jar of nectar. So, and we also know the different, you know, as demigoddesses, she got a curse and, you know, she came down and she married Shantanu and Bhishma Dev was born and also in Chaitanya Leela, she is born as daughter of Nityananda Prabhu, Ganga Mata Goswamini. And she married Chantra again, who was Madhva in Chaitanya Lila. So these are some of the facts. And Bhakti Rasamrita Maharaj, he says that she is called as Vraja Prema Manjari in Goloka. And she is called as Mitra Vinda in Dwaraka. So these are all some of the facts about the personality of Ganges, the spiritual identity and the identity as demigoddess and everything. So, she is also known as Triptika because she flows through all the three worlds, the heavenly planets. She flows through earth and she flows through the lower planets as well. So in the heavenly planet, she is called as Mandakini. In the earth planet, she is called as Ganges. And in the lower planet, she is called as Bhogavati. So she purifies all three planets. Like how Srimad Bhagavatam purifies the speaker, the listener, and the questioner. So Mother Ganges flows through all three worlds. The only river which flows through all three worlds is Mother Ganges. So that's that's how we need to understand, right? And all the sacred rivers and all the sacred festivals. You know, Krishna stages things in such a way to give crucial lessons to us. Say, for example, from that particular story of churning of milk ocean and how it is related to Ganges being sacred during Kumbha Mela time. So that is the essence of all these stories, right? So when Krishna wants to speak through the holy scriptures, so say for example, if you or me, if we commit an aparad, that won't be spoken after five or five thousand years. So there are like all divine personalities which Krishna identifies if he wants to pass us a message 
through the scriptures. So it is very, very important for us to understand, you know, keep reading it again and again, churning the scriptures again and again. Each and every time, as and when you progress in your devotion, in your bhakti life, you will get a lot of different realizations. So, and every time when Krishna puts us in a situation where things are not under our control, you know, he tries to make us more and more humble. That's an opportunity to cultivate humility. So, for example, Parikshit Maharaj, he had all the army to go into the Shaini Rishi's house and then reverse the curse. But he accepted it. He accepted that he made a mistake. Though it was attentively or inattentively, he accepted that as a mistake because he saw an opportunity to surrender more to Krishna. And he accepted that as the will of the Lord. So Vidura leaving the palace, he accepted that as the will of the Lord. So how much we can tolerate, how much we can be humble when situation squeezes us. So there are a lot of stories from which we can understand all of this. And after all that, people go to the bank of a river and they meet sages and they have conversations. So it is very, very evident from the fact that once you go near a sacred river, the mercy comes through Vaishnavas, pure devotees. And that is how you get Krishna clean. Krishna cannot give love for himself. He puts you in touch with his devotees. Who has that love? Who can give that love? So that's why we worship uh, Srimati Radharani, who is the giver of devotion. She is called as Bhakti Pradayani, giver of devotion. So, from all of this, what we can understand that, you know, having that particular faith and associating with sacred rivers or even by remembering them, you know, one can be purified and get that impetus or the devotional attitude or the servitor attitude in bhakti. And it's, it's also Prabhupada says, right, like understanding, showing gratitude, having the right conception and then taking bath in that river, you get maximum benefits. Else you are committing an offense against the Holy Name. So Prabhupada also instructed very, very clearly that none of us should actually take bath in Radha Kund. Prabhupada was very, very clear in most of the places, in his most of the lectures, room conversations, because we are not at that platform and we have to be very, very careful. Even if you have smallest of desire, or even if you think that you have committed an offense, then you are not qualified to even touch the waters of Radha Kund. So, and Prabhupada says there is, <clears throat> even if we are no, if we don't have the right conception, even how many other times you take bath and ganga, that's not hundred percent beneficial. And if if we think that you no, know, I commit all the sins and I go take a dip in ganga or I go and visit Puri Jagannath and that will purify me, of course, but not from one hundred percent. At the same time, in Garuda Purana and Vishnu Purana, it's mentioned that such behaviors or such attitude, Vishnu becomes furious as well. So most of the problem is people take only one side of the story because of a fragmental thought process and they don't understand the full, pro the full essence of Shastras. So we need to read carefully, reconcile, everything is reconcilable. Whether you have the vision or knowledge to do it is a question. If you don't have it, take guidance of your acharyas and reading one half of it and saying that yeah it is mentioned here i'll be doing this which it's not going to be fruitful for cultivating the law of god which is our ultimate goal so again few other you know benefits of ganga so in this in this purport few of the purpose profile is mentioned that there are external benefits one become immune to diseases robot often gives story of a businessman right so he never went to doctor in his life. He takes bath and ganges regularly. And once when he was sick, he mentioned that, no, no, why, why do we need to see a doctor? He went and took bath and ganges and he was automatically purified. And there are internal benefits which we discussed. So coming back to external benefits, right? You now there are some of scientific research is done 
its ganges is having antimicrobial properties in 1896 when you know the cholera bacteria was put in the water of ganges it didn't last for more than three hours but in a normal distilled water it could sustain for 48 hours and scientists also discovered that the oxygen content is more in Ganges and it is having bacteriophagal properties that the water can be used for a lot more scientific inventions and targeting particular bacteria and curing a lot of diseases. This was published back in uh, 1896. I can give you the reference of the article if required. And also in the Bajagovindam prayers, verse number 21, Shankaracharya says this, let a man read but a little from Bhagavad Gita, drink just a drop of Ganga water, worship but once Murari, the enemy of Mura, Lord Krishna, he then will have no confrontation with Yama. So you get protected. So the worst case, even if you don't have a proper conception, you get protected from Yamaraj. You will at least get bare minimum, you know, if you have that much faith, that you have committed since bare minimum you will get at least a human form of life in a lower family or in some other family. So these are some of the benefits of uh, Ganga and the scientific benefits. Ganga water, Ganges water remains pure even after being stored for so many days which is not possible with any other water. So even science, there are scientific facts about benefits of Ganga on the material platform. How is this all possible? It's only possible because of the divine aspects. So we understand the descent of Ganges properly from the stories of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we will have the right conception when we go live by the sacred rivers. So I think I'll stop here. Any questions? Yes. covered that in the class there is no exact description mentioned why did he do that but what we can understand is what we can infer from this from what our acharyas have done even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited all the sacred rivers so it's mentioned in the purport that Kapiladev went and identified the source of Ganges Gangotri which is the Gomuk which is called as the mouth of earth and how water flows from Mount Meru and when the altitude was so high it is frozen. So each and every place has a significance. So a lot of sages they see that as a way to connect with Krishna depending on their rasa. So he travels through all the path from there and he finally took shelter in Ganga Sagar because that is the delta where in India it merges with Bay of Bengal. Then from there it flows to Bangladesh and it merges with Brahmaputra. So all these places have significance and that is where he actually built his hermitage because that's the last point where Ganges completely merges with Bay of Bengal. So each and every place as I mentioned, right, it starts from uh, the Alaknanda stream, it starts from Badrinath, Joshimath and then it goes on to Nanda Prayag and then Rudra Prayag where Kedarnath starts. Each and every place has a significance. So in Joshima, I mentioned that Narshinga Dev is there where the arms become thin and it is mentioned that day we are not able to see the arms, the access to Satopan Glacier will be closed. And similarly, I think uh, the Rudra Prayag has a story, not Rudra Prayag, I think uh, one of the Prayag has a story where uh, no, Shiva, Lord Shiva put his trident in a mountain 
and to fulfill Mother Parvati's thirst. And from there, a river came. So there are there are a lot of stories like this. So I think if you know if you see the seminar by Bhakti Rasanatha Maharaj, Sacred Rivers of India, that's a four-day seminar. So he speaks a lot about all the sacred rivers and he gives a lot of significance for each of the river. And besides, he also mentions this confluences a lot more in detail. He gives a lot of significance of each and every confluence that is a temple. So before uh, you know Bhagirathi uh, it flows from Gangotri. It it also flows through a place called Hanuman Chatti, and that's that's where uh, I think it's if I'm not wrong, it's uh, that's origination of Kedarnath, and that place has a particular significance. And origination of Yamuna, you know the Bandar Punch Mountain, that's where the Yamunotri Glacier originates from, and that place has a particular significance because. After uh, Ravan lights fire on tail of Hanuman, on the lake of the Bandarpulch mountain is where Lord Hanuman came and put his tail and set off the fire. So every place has a significance, right? So meeting in that particular place, you know, going and visiting that temples when we go on a pilgrimage, we would be able to get that love for Krishna. We would be able to get purify our hearts and get that devotional attitude. So that is how most of the sages see it and that is how even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw it. He was literally taking three times bath every day in Ganges. And he was playing with his all friends. He was actually doing Krishna Leela to fulfill the Ganges desire. And when um, Keshav Kashmiri came there, he instructed him to just to cultivate humility, knowingly or unknowingly, he asked him to compose verses. No, Kesha Kashmiri, on the spot he composes 100 verses glorifying Mother Ganges. So when we go in all these spots, right, like when, say for example, when we go to Raghunath Das Goswami's Bhajan Kutir, so he was like really, really austere. What we are doing right now is not at all any austerity. So when Mahaprabhu left this world, like he wanted to leave his body. He actually literally stopped eating. He only ate some small leaf or something, some small prashad one time a day. And then Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami, he went there and they said that, no, 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 you don't have to leave your body, you'll have to talk about Krishna Katha. You know what exactly he does? 22 hours in a day, he speaks Krishna Katha. And he does 2,200 Dandavats in front of the deities. And he does 1,000 Dandavats every day in front of Vaishnavas. And every day, 6 to 7 hours, he spent 15 years with Mahaprabhu. Every day, 6 to 7 hours, he talks Chaitanya Lila. He talks Krishna Katha. And some of the days he hardly sleeps for one, one and a half hours a day. And then when Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami left, like he stopped even drinking water. He was just reciting the holy name and he was living. So when we go to all these type of places, right, we can connect more with Krishna and understand what are the austerities, what is the significance of that temple, what are the pastimes the Lord has performed. So that you can, depending on your rasa, you can cultivate bhakti. And people who does not have that rasa, going to these sacred places, we purify them and they will get that taste for bhakti. They will get that attitude to perform bhakti or to at least progress in bhakti. So what Prabhupada says, when we go and take dip in Ganges during any of the festivals or any of the auspicious days, we should only desire for pure bhakti, love for Krishna, we should not desire for anything else. I hope uh, this clarified. Any other questions? Okay, all good. You can wrap up. Gantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Jag Guru Shila Prabhupada ki, Nathai Gauru Primaradi. Hare Krishna.